All right. Hi. Um, I'm going to be addressing the following problem. So we observe some data from some stochastic dynamical system, and the systems we have in mind are continuous time stochastic processes. And can we then learn a graph that kind of uh, represent and describe the independent structure of um, the system? And of course, this is a classical problem if we, con if we are considering systems of random variables. So the new thing is really to be considering um, stochastic processes. Um, so to give, to give an outline of, um, of this talk, I, I'm just going to highlight what this paper contributes. So first of all, we give an abstract proof of um, the equivalence of the pairwise and global Markov properties um, in this dynamical setup. And one of the advantages, what, I mean, what do I mean by an abstract proof? I mean that we list some properties that this independence model should fulfill, uh, which are then sufficient to show this equivalence. And one of the advantages of giving such a list of properties is that it becomes very easy to extend um, this proof to other classes of stochastic processes because there's basically a checklist then we just have to show that these processes hold, or sorry, that these properties hold for a specific class of uh, processes. So this is the next bullet point. Uh, we use this to extend this um, equivalence result to a larger class of stochastic processes. And in the end, we also give a learning algorithm which can output a graph that, um, defi that represents this um, independence model. All right, to make this a little bit more specific, we're going to take this example. So let's say we observe a multivariate um, point process. Um, so such a process, it, its distribution is described by these intensity processes, um, lambda. And basically, we can, I mean, I've given a realization here of um, such a process. So we have four coordinate processes. And the thing I observe is basically just some time points. I've marked these with these dots. And then also I know, I mean, these are the events, and I also know to what coordinate process this event uh, corresponds. And the intensity basically describes the likelihood of observing an event in the immediate future uh, conditionally on the past. And the question I'm asking myself here is, can I, how should I describe the dependent structure of such a system? Uh, what I'm asking is, how can I describe what's about to happen in one process given the, the histories of the others? So for instance here, I'm fixing a time point T and then I'm uh, looking at my first coordinate process that I'm calling B. And then I'm asking if I were to guess at what's gonna happen at time T in B, would I be better off having both the information processes uh, C and A, or could I do equally well with only the information in the history of the processes in, in the set C? Um, and already here, I'm kind of hinting at something important that this is going to be asymmetric. So the way that B and A enters here is not symmetric. So I'm going to uh, just use that as a precursor. To make it a little bit more formal, this is known as local independence. And you can see that, first of all, I'm going to have this index C V throughout the talk. And in this other slide, V is just the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's just an index set of my coordinate processes. I'm taking three subsets of this V, and now I'm defining this ternary relation. So this is very much like conditional independence um, of random variables, and it's going to uh, serve the same purpose, basically. Um, so I'm going to say that B is local independent of A given C. If whenever I look at this mean value process, it's a conditional mean process, I'm giving it the information in both the history of A and C, but actually it doesn't depend on what happened in A. So this is what I'm going to call local independence then. Um, to give an even more concrete example, one specific class of point processes are the linear Hawks processes, and those are especially nice because I can write the intensity process like this decomposition. So we have some constant, and then we have a sum over all the other processes, over all processes in, in my multivariate point process. And then I have for each, I mean, these tau's are then the previous events. So I have a contribution for each of the previous events. 
And in this case, I'm going to have local independence. So I'm going to have the beta is local independent of alpha, given everything but alpha, if and only if this g alpha beta function is ident identically equal to 0. So this basically means that knowing all of the other stuff, alpha is not going to um, influence the intensity of beta. All right. So I want some kind of graphical representation of this. So in the end, I can learn a graph which represents this local independence structure. And the way to do this, or one way to do this, is use these directed graphs. So first of all, uh, a directed graph is just one that has only directed edges. And furthermore, I mean, there could be loops, there could be cycles. And we can construct a local independence graph in this way that I just exclude the edge from alpha to beta if and only if I have this local independence of beta uh, from alpha, uh, given everything but alpha. OK, so in the title, I also promised something about partial observation. So we need kind of some kind of graphical marginalization. And this is done exactly as in other, uh, or can be done in, as in, in other classes of graphs using latent projection. So let's say that I now don't observe eta and theta in the top graph. Well. I can use this latent projection to get a graph which encodes the um, independence structure over the observed variables. And please remember, uh, remember that each node is identified to a coordinate process. So each node represents the entirety of a co coordinate process. OK, so this will give me a larger class of graphs, which are the directed mixed uh, graphs uh, to represent these partially observed local independence models, and we equip this uh, class of graphs with a graphical separation criterion, which is called mu separation. And um, this is very much like M separation, but again, also asymmetric. Uh, what we are trying to model is local independence, which is asymmetric, uh, and therefore also this separation criterion should be. And to make totally clear what I mean by that, well, I mean, we're considering some abstract independence model. Um, and what I mean by symmetry is that whenever I have that B is independent of A given C, then that implies that A is also independent of B given C. So this is what I don't have. And of course, this is something we have for conditional independence. But in this case, this does not hold true. And it just changes all of the theory and also the graphs and the separation criterion that I need to, to, to use. Um, so symmetry is one of these uh, classical semigraphoid uh, properties, and that does not hold, but some of the others do hold, and now they just have left and right versions. Because in the classical setup, you don't need to dis distinguish between left and right versions, uh, because you have symmetry, so one follows from the other. Uh, but now you do uh, need to dis distinguish that. OK. so. A key result is then to show that we actually have the global Markov property in this local independence graph. Um, so under some regularity conditions, one can show, and we do that in the, in the paper. It's also um, reproducible because you can read the proof um, that there's actually an equivalence between the pairwise Markov property and the global Markov property. Um, so this means that. If I construct my local independence graph and I take my mu separation criterion and there's a separation, then there's also going to be a local independence. And we show this to hold uh, for point processes and, and E2 processes, uh, these E2 processes being the new thing, uh, as this was a known result for the point processes. All right. So what we want to do now is to give an Oracle learning algorithm to output a graph that represents this local independence uh, model. And we're going to assume that we have faithfulness. So we're going to assume that we have a local independence model, which, I mean, is described exactly by some DMG, direct and mixed graph. And to learn a graph, we're just going to exploit a couple of facts about um, these DMGs. The first one is that every Marco equivalence class has a maximal element. I'm going to show you on the next slide exactly what I mean by that. This is a very nice uh, property 
Furthermore, we can actually construct this maximal graph directly from a well-defined list of independence tests. And this makes the, conceptually, this makes the learning problem completely trivial because I can just consider any kind of edge and then see if the corresponding list of independencies are fulfilled or not, and I will know whether or not to include this in my maximal DMG. Um, this is just not a very efficient way of doing it, so we're gonna suggest a different way of doing it, which is very much like the FCI algorithm in, in the um, classical case. Okay, to get back to this Marco equivalence, so we saw the DMG3 earlier, and this is the graphs one to six, are, uh, they, they constitute a Marco equivalence class. So th these uh, six graphs all encode the same um, separations. So I won't be able to tell them apart just from their independence model, and one of them is maximal. So the graph one is maximal in the sense that it's a super graph of all the other Marco equivalent graphs. Um, and this is a general fact that such a maximal element will always exist. And then if I want to represent the entire equivalence class, that's quite easy. And this is what is, is done using a direct and mixed equivalence graph, so that's graph seven. I basically just copy my maximal graph over, and then I leave each edge solid if it's in every member of the equivalence class. For instance, the bidirected edge between alpha and beta, that edge is in all the graphs one to six. So from the equivalent, uh, sorry, from the independence model, I know that that edge must be there. Um, on the other hand, the directed edge from uh, alpha to beta is in the maximal graph, but it's for instance not in the graph four. So I, we, we just present that as dashed. And in a certain sense, this encodes all the local information about edges, which edges could be there and which uh, could not be there. Those are totally absent and which are undetermined, uh, un uh, on which are we, uh, ca can we determine if, if they're not there or not. Okay, that became very complicated, but I mean a dashed edge just means that it might be there and it might not be there. Um, and a word of caution is then that I can't remove any combination of dashed edges. So in, in this specific graph, I'm not gonna be able to take my maximal graph and remove both the directed edge from gamma to beta and the directed edge from delta to beta. That won't give me something Marco equivalent. And this is what I mean by this being dashed, that's really a local information about that specific edge. It just means that uh, there exists some Marco equivalent uh, DMG in which this edge is absent. Okay, to go to the learning algorithm. So I'm just gonna go through the learning algorithm using a simple example. Uh, so let's say that I observe an independence model which is encoded by this graph. I'm just gonna leave all the true edges green all the time to kind of make it more easy to see what's going on. And now I'm gonna basically sketch a learning algorithm which is very much like the FCI algorithm. So we start out by the complete graph. And then querying my oracle, I will find for instance that in this original graph, uh, epsilon is gonna be separated from uh, alpha by gamma. And like in the FCI algorithm, I can conclude that these two edges that are between alpha and epsilon and have heads into epsilon, they can't be there because that would be a violation of the independence that I just found. So I can remove those two. And I can keep doing that and I can do it in a somewhat clever fashion as in the FCI algorithm, like kind of testing some sets uh, that are chosen in a clever way to not have to test every possible, possible set. And what I get out of this first step is then what we've called a separability graph, uh, which is somewhat analogous to the skeleton in the FCI case, uh, because it encodes um, which pairs of, of nodes can be separated. And from this, I can then further prune this graph. So we saw, I mean, I already had this independence that epsilon was independent of alpha given gamma. 
I also know from the edge that is from alpha to beta that I can never separate beta from alpha. And then looking at the graph, well, if I can separate epsilon from alpha conditioning only on gamma, one can realize that then the edge from beta to epsilon can never be there. And we can, in that fashion, we can kind of, without making more independence tests, we can uh, prune the graph. This is the second step, uh, just running through this, reusing the information. Um, and then in the third step, we kind of have to consult this list of uh, independencies, these potential sibling and parent criteria that I talked about uh, before, uh, even though that might be, uh, be costly. But this is to make sure that in the end, we actually do output this unique maximal rep representative of the Marco equivalence class. So this is exactly uh, the graph, which is maximal and is in the equivalence class of uh, G0. So this actually does encode the independence model that I was looking for. And then the final step is to just construct the DMEG from that graph. And that requires no independence test. That's a purely graphical uh, operation because I'm just asking, well, in this graph, for instance, could I remove the uh, edge from gamma to delta and maintain Marco equivalence? And in this case, uh, the answer is yes. So I, I marked as, that one as, um, as dashed. All right, that's it. <laughs>